Some serial killers target a specific group of people and kill in an area familiar to them. But one serial killer's decision to not target a particular type of person meant that anyone could be a victim. His mode of transport meant that he could strike anywhere in the United States. In this episode, we take a look at the notorious Angel Resendez. He had never experienced anything like it before. His heart began pounding and he started feeling sick. There was absolute silence. This was a situation that not everyone experiences. At times like this, the Florida State Penitentiary would go into lockdown. All prisoners were confined to their cells. There was complete darkness too, as all power in the penitentiary had to be diverted towards the execution chamber. He knew, as did others, exactly when the execution was being carried out, as the lights would come on momentarily before turning off again. For one prisoner named Angel Resendez, it felt as though the Grim Reaper was hovering over the prison as executions took place. This was Resendez's first time behind bars and it wouldn't be his last. It took Virginia Resendez weeks to collect the $1 birth registration fee and if it wasn't for her cousins and friends, she'd have been unable to pay the medical fees. When her husband learned that Virginia was expecting her third child, he told her that he was leaving Izuka de Matamoros, located in Puebla, Mexico, to find work over the border. He never came back. The baby was a boy, and to avoid being fined for not registering his birth sooner, Virginia listed her son's birth as days later than his actual 1st of August, 1959 birthday. But Virginia had hope for her son. She had once been told by a priest that she would have a boy who would make her famous. For that reason, she named her son Angel. After Angel was born, Virginia's sister would look after Angel so that Virginia could work at a luncheonette. Her 12-hour shifts earned her a little over a dollar. As Angel grew older, he began playing with other children in the neighbourhood. At home, his only toy was a teddy bear. But as we all know, children can be mean, and Angel's small stature and name led to bullying. At school, Angel showed potential, but crime soon began calling his name. Crime was a big problem in his neighbourhood, and by age six, Angel began stealing food so he could eat. This progressed to supplying stolen fruit to local street sellers. On weekends, Angel would jump trains and travel to the city centre just to steal. Angel knew his family had little money. Their income just about allowed them to eat one meal a day. Not only would he steal the food his family ate, he stole the clothes they wore too. Angel didn't just travel into the city centre to steal. He went there for recreational reasons as well. He enjoyed bullfighting and would sneak into local arenas to watch. He would also visit the only library in the city, even though his lack of attendance at school meant he had difficulty reading. The family dynamic changed when Angel was six. For a while, it had just been Virginia and her children, but then Louis Maturino entered her life. They made plans to marry. When Louis tried to discipline Virginia's children, tension began to build between the children and their stepfather, and it was Louis and Angel who fought the most. Virginia then made a decision that would have a lasting effect on her relationship with her third child. She sent Angel to live with her brother, as she didn't want the tension in the house to upset her husband. Angel felt rejected by his mother, and he stopped going to school. He would now go on long-distance journeys by hopping onto open train cars, only returning to his uncle when the hunger became too much. 
Virginia would try to make peace with Angel later on, but Angel had this to say about his mother's attempts to fix their relationship. She could never mend the pain and unhappiness. She was trying to buy love, but it was already too late. In 1972, Angel left his uncle's home for the final time. His mother and her husband had now moved to Ciudad Juarez. Angel was on his own, and by the age of 13, he'd taught himself to read by reading discarded newspapers. He formed a pickpocketing and burglary gang with a group of homeless older boys. At night, the gang slept in fields. Angel was sexually assaulted by two of the gang's leaders. The assault led to Angel abusing drugs and alcohol. By now, Angel had learned about the many Mexicans who travelled over the border to work in the United States each year. Angel left Puebla behind and headed to Ciudad Juarez. If there was one thing his mother could do for him, it was to help Angel get to the United States. Given that Virginia had experience crossing the border with the help of a mule, Angel decided to use the services of one. His first trip across the border took him to El Paso, Texas. It was during his first trips to El Paso that Angel began using hard drugs and smuggling cannabis over the border. Angel learned English quickly, but was still based in Mexico, where he worked as a mechanic for a successful auto thief, for who Angel would sometimes steal cars for over the border. By now, Angel was regularly crossing the border illegally by hopping trains, and the law soon caught up to him. But Angel avoided the fines and jail by giving the authorities a different name each time he was caught. He could travel by train to anywhere in the US, and law enforcement there had no clue about his previous encounters with the law. Angel was simply sent back to Mexico. Angel was only in his teens when he began robbing houses in the US. He'd noticed how slowly freight trains moved through towns and cities. Angel got a kick out of watching people through windows as the train he'd hopped on passed by their houses. The empty houses he travelled past seemed like an open invitation to Angel and he robbed those houses before escaping on another train. With time, Angel progressed to robbing occupied houses and would sometimes target two or three houses in one night before leaving town on the next train. By the late 1970s, Angel was renting three lockers at a bus station to keep stolen items in. But Angel's luck finally ran out on the 6th of September 1979 when he was convicted of vehicle theft, burglary and the aggravated assault of 88-year-old Gilbert Chase in Miami. Gilbert died a few months after the attack, but Angel was never charged with murder as there was no way to prove that Gilbert hadn't died of natural causes. Life at the Florida State Penitentiary was a shock to Angel's system. He was bullied, got little sleep, was prescribed antidepressants and considered suicide. He witnessed the death of a guard who was stabbed with a shank and pushed off the second tier of the prison block. He began studying right-wing politics, the US Libertarian Party and fascism. Angel devoted time to reading about Richard Ramirez, a serial killer also known as the Night Stalker. Angel tasted freedom on the 3rd of September 1985 and was deported to Mexico. But the paranoia and flashbacks he had about prison life weren't enough to stop him from returning to the US to commit crimes. He was once sent back to Mexico after a train he was on in Oklahoma was searched and his fingerprints were matched to those he had taken when he was released from prison in Florida. But despite his fingerprints being on record, his numerous aliases and his tendency to alter his date of birth meant that he could cross the border and travel around the US unnoticed. Angel's constant jumping from trains led to a hurt knee and the development of a shuffling walk. He wanted to move away from a life of crime. 
In the 1980s, Angel was imprisoned more than once. To try and get away from his old lifestyle, he moved to Rodeo, Mexico, and bought a two-bedroom single-storey house from a farmer for $1,000. He even began teaching English at a convent school. In 1995, Angel, now 33, met a woman called Julieta, a lab analyst at a public health clinic in the town, and she soon moved in with him. Angel told his girlfriend that he was working agricultural jobs in the US and would send home $140 each month. It was in the US, Angel told Julieta, that he joined anti-homosexual and anti-abortion groups. But Angel was keeping a secret from Julieta. The man Julieta thought of as a gentleman was unable to stay away from crime, and instead of working in agriculture, Angel was travelling across the US by train and committing burglaries, for which he sometimes served time in prison. And his crimes were about to escalate. The 28th to the 29th of August 1997 had been a night of fun for Christopher Mayer, 21, and his girlfriend, Holly Dunn Pendleton, and it should have continued that way. The couple were students at the University of Kentucky at Lexington, and were making their way from one party to another when their lives were irrevocably changed. As they walked alongside the main railway track that runs through the university on the edge of Lexington, Angel Resendez jumped out of some bushes and threatened them with a knife while demanding money. Neither Chris or Holly had cash on them and offered to give Angel their credit cards. Instead, Angel ordered the couple to sit down. Angel used Chris's backpack to tie his hands behind his back using the straps. He then tied Holly's hands behind her back with her belt. Holly would later recall how when Angel briefly walked away, she began strategizing with Chris about how they might escape. Holly chose not to flee as she didn't want to leave Chris. Then Angel returned carrying a large rock and he dropped it on Chris's head. Angel then beat Holly so savagely that he broke her jaw and eye socket. He then raped her. Thinking that Chris and Holly were dead, Angel covered them with branches and left the scene. He was right in thinking that Chris was dead, but Holly was still alive. Her injuries were so bad that when paramedics arrived, they thought she was dead. The only description of Angel that Holly could give was that he looked like a Mexican migrant worker. The police entered details of Chris's murder and Holly's attack into the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Programme. Speaking about her ordeal, Holly later said, I wanted to crawl in a hole and never come out again, but that would have meant that I let this monster take me away. After committing this crime, Angel headed home to Julieta and began taking English classes. In the fall of 1998, Julieta announced that she was pregnant. During that same season, Angel killed again. Given his small stature, Angel deliberately targeted people he knew he could take on and he made no exception to this rule on the 2nd of October 1998. He arrived by train in the town of Hughes Springs, Texas, and targeted the home of Leafy Mason, who was in her 80s. She lived just 50 yards, or 45 metres, from the train tracks. Angel broke into Leafy's home by entering through an unlocked ground floor window and beat Leafy to death with an antique flat iron. She was also sexually assaulted. Before leaving, Angel helped himself to some food and stole cash and jewellery. Leafy was later found dead by friends. Angel killed again on the 17th of December, 1998. He jumped off a freight train as it passed through the Houston, Texas suburb of West University Place. He picked a house in the 4200 block of La High Street, next to the railway, and broke in through the garage door. 
The alarm system had been turned off and no one was home. As he made his way through the home, Angel saw things he didn't like. A statue he came across looked demonic and the medical literature he found indicated to Angel that whoever lived in the home was experimenting on fetuses and performing abortions. As Angel began stealing money, electronics, jewellery and ivory figurines, Dr Claudia Benton, 39, arrived home in her Jeep Cherokee. She was a paediatric neurologist at the Baylor College of Medicine. She was expecting to come home to an empty house as her husband and twin daughters were out of town at the time. But as she entered her home, Angel grabbed her and took her upstairs to the main bedroom. Angel beat Claudia with a two-foot-tall bronze statue, repeatedly stabbed her with a kitchen knife and raped her. Angel fled the scene in Claudia's vehicle. When the police found Claudia, she was face down on the floor, her head was partially inside a plastic bag and her torso was covered with blankets. The Jeep Cherokee was found in San Antonio, Texas, two days after Claudia was found dead. Angel's fingerprints were found on the vehicle's steering column and on the broken pieces of the car's steering lock left outside Claudia's house. There wasn't enough evidence to charge Angel with murder, but on the 7th of January 1999, an arrest warrant was issued for Angel's arrest under the name of Rafael Rosendez Ramirez, charging him with burglarising Claudia's home. If Kentucky had been part of the same forensic cross-referencing crime system as Texas at the time, evidence from Claudia's murder would have been matched with evidence from Chris Mayer's murder, and it would have been clear that the same person was the perpetrator of both murders. Angel headed back home just in time to donate money to the convent in Rodeo for Christmas 1998. He wanted gifts to be bought for the town's poor children. He stuck around for a while and was often seen going on long bike rides with his dog, Patol. Angel's daughter was born in spring 1999 and by April of that year, Angel was on the road again. Angel headed back to Texas, this time jumping off a train in Weimar. Reverend Norman Skip Cernick, 46, and his wife Karen, 47, lived in a parsonage at the United Church of Christ. The couple spent the evening of the 30th of April, 1999, talking to Skip's mother on the phone. As that day came to a close, Angel slit the screen on the back door of their home with a knife. Using a 16-pound sledgehammer he'd found in a car, Angel bludgeoned the couple to death and left the weapon leaning against the bedroom wall. Angel stole a VCR, gaming console and jewellery before leaving in the couple's red 1998 Mazda pickup truck. The couple's bodies were discovered when Skip failed to show up for the 10am Sunday service and the Weimar police had to investigate the first murders the town had experienced. As the Weimar police didn't have a crime scene unit, the sheriff's department had to help out. Evidence from Skip and Karen's murder was matched to evidence from Dr Claudia Benton's murder. Police Chief Randy Kennedy was investigating Leafy Mason's murder and when he learned of the Cernick murders, he posted details about Leafy's murder in the Texas Crime Bulletin. A copy of the warrant issued for Angel was also published online. Skip and Karen's pickup was later found in San Antonio, but not before 1,200 people attended their funeral. On the 2nd of June, 1999, Angel attempted to cross the border, but was stopped by the Immigration and Naturalisation Service. As the INS computer network wasn't connected to any law enforcement database, they didn't know that Angel was a wanted man. He was deported to Mexico. It didn't take long for him to sneak back across the border.
The next day, 26-year-old Noemi Dominguez was in her apartment sketching Japanese animation figures for a children's book she wanted to write. Noemi taught at the Benjamin Franklin Elementary School in Houston. She had eight siblings and regularly told her younger sister to lock her doors at night and to watch out for people hanging around near her house. But that night, Noemi was the one targeted. Angel jumped from a train just a few hundred yards from Noemi's apartment. He broke into her home and bludgeoned her to death with a pickaxe. Before leaving with money and valuables, Angel spent an hour in the apartment, eating chicken and rice and drinking beer. Angel drove down Highway 10 in Noemi's white 1993 Honda Civic and stopped just three miles from Weimar at a house next to the highway. The owner of the house was Josephine Convicker, a 73-year-old grandmother who raised cows on the property. It hadn't even been a month since she attended the funerals of Skip and Karen Cernick. Angel killed Josephine as she slept with a single blow to the head from either a garden tool or the same pickaxe he used to kill Noemi hours earlier. Once again, Angel ate food before leaving in Noemi's car, which he then abandoned on the International Bridge in Del Rio, Texas. Josephine was found that same day by her daughter. After Noemi failed to return phone calls, two of her siblings headed to Noemi's apartment where they found her body in the bedroom. Forensic evidence soon linked Angel to the murders of the Cernics, Noemi Dominguez, Josephine Convica and Dr Claudia Benton. The authorities also knew that in the murders of Noemi and Claudia, Angel had painted symbols in blood on the walls that looked similar to signs left by serial killer Richard Ramirez. As it became increasingly obvious that a serial killer was at large, the FBI was called in to help. The FBI field office in Houston, of which Don C. Clark was in charge, launched Operation Stop Train on the 9th of June 1999. The FBI issued a holding charge against Angel of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for burglarising Dr. Claudia Benton's home. Speaking about Angel's race, investigators said... We feel sorry for any Hispanic male walking along the road right now. People around here are used to living with their doors, windows and cars unlocked. But there's fear down here now, I'll be frank with you. Our gun stores have all sold out of their weapons. Former FBI profiler John Douglas theorised that Angel likely started out killing male transients. Douglas said Angel was targeting people because they had something he needed, like food or money. The sexual element of some of the murders was secondary. The level of violence in the murders suggested Angel was angry at someone he didn't know, like society. Angel learned that the authorities were after him when he read a rodeo newspaper article about himself. There was now a $125,000 reward on offer and Texas Ranger Drew Carter began contacting Angel's relatives in the US and Mexico. When Angel learned about this, he left town telling Julieta, It's better to run. I cannot stand prison. They're after me and I have no choice. If they find me, let them kill me. Surveillance of Angel's home began two days after he left town. When Julietta learned that Angel was wanted for murder, she gave detectives over 100 pieces of jewellery that would be later linked to Angel's victims. She also told investigators that Angel's sister, Manuela, lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and that she kept in contact with Angel. Texas Ranger Drew Carter soon got in touch with Manuela. Angel struck again in Gorham, Illinois, killing a father and daughter. George Marber Sr. was 80 and Carolyn Frederick was 52. George was a retired prison employee and an army veteran. 
George lived in a mobile home only 100 yards from the train tracks and he often gave food to people travelling on the rails. On the 15th of June 1999, George left his home to run errands, unaware that Angel was watching him from behind some trees. As soon as George headed out, Angel broke into his home. When George returned home with a newspaper, Angel tied him to a recliner with a telephone cord. Angel then picked up George's shotgun and shot the elderly man once in the head. That was when Carolyn stopped by to clean her father's home. Angel beat her to death with the shotgun, using enough force to break the shotgun in half. He then sexually assaulted her. Like he had after the other murders, Angel stuck around for a while. He spent up to five hours in the trailer, eating food, taking down family photos and reading the newspaper. Carolyn's husband, Don, found the bodies after he was unable to contact his wife and father-in-law. And elsewhere in Illinois, George's wife lay in a hospital bed after being admitted the day before with chronic heart trouble. The TV in her hospital room had to be removed so she couldn't learn the details of her husband's murder. Angel's fingerprints were found in George's trailer. George's red Chevrolet pickup truck was found the following day in Cairo, Illinois, 60 miles south of Gorham. Leafy Mason's murder had now been linked to Angel. Freight trains in Texas were regularly stopped so that law enforcement could search for Angel. Alarm company sales peaked and sightings of Angel were reported, although many of these sightings were of Hispanic men mistaken for the wanted man. Angel had the honour of being placed at the top of the FBI's most wanted list, knocking Osama bin Laden off the top spot. An arrest warrant was issued and bail was set at $1 million. But just days after George and Carolyn were killed, one woman had an encounter with Angel in a Percy, Illinois laundromat. She said, they say death has many faces, but for me it will always be his twisted face. I could see his cold, black eyes staring at me through the glass of the laundromat window. By now, the authorities had been able to determine Angel's true identity, and it came as no surprise when the authorities in Ciudad Juarez linked Angel to 15 murders, with at least eight of the killings having similarities to the murders committed in the US. A public appeal was made to Angel, asking him to turn himself in. It was his sister, Manuela, however, who was instrumental in getting her brother to surrender. Texas Ranger Drew Carter received a call from Manuela while he was fishing with friends. She told him that Angel was willing to give himself up. The East Letter Bridge was built over the Rio Grande and on the 13th of July 1999, Angel began crossing the bridge from Zaragoza, Mexico. His brother, sister and a pastor followed him across the bridge. When he reached the El Paso, Texas end, he met Texas Ranger Carter, shook hands with him and was arrested. During questioning, Angel refused to talk about his crimes at first. Instead, he discussed mathematics, economics, capitalism, the treatment of migrant workers and certain US government policies like the air campaign in Yugoslavia. Alan Tanner, Angel's court-appointed lawyer, hoped the Mexican consulate in the US would put pressure on the authorities not to seek the death penalty. When Angel's family had negotiated the terms of his surrender, Angel had apparently been promised immunity from the death penalty. Towards the end of July, a grand jury indicted Angel on a capital murder charge for the murder of Dr Claudia Benton. Angel's trial began in Houston on the 8th of May 2000. 
Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Bruce Cohen told the court that Angel was schizophrenic and didn't know his actions were wrong because his illness led him to believe his victims were evil. This, said Cohen, made Angel think his actions were justified. Dr. Raymond Laval, who testified for the prosecution, said Angel had an unhealthy view of mankind in general, but knew that what he'd done was wrong. After ten hours of deliberation, the jury found Angel guilty of the murder of Dr. Claudia Benton. That same jury had the option to sentence Angel to life in prison, but chose to sentence him to death. On death row, Angel was known as the Choo Choo Man. When he wasn't confessing to even more murders, he apparently spent his time trying to sell his autograph for over $50 and sold hair clippings. His original execution date was postponed so that a competency hearing could be held. Angel described himself as half man, half angel. He believed that three days after his execution, he would awaken in the Middle East and help the Jewish fight. A Houston judge eventually ruled that Angel was mentally competent to be executed. On the 27th of June 2006, opponents of the death penalty protested outside the Huntsville unit in Huntsville, Texas. Inside the prison, preparations were made for Angel's execution. He declined a last meal and his daughter visited him for the final time. His execution was delayed as the Supreme Court deliberated over a number of issues surrounding the case, including the humaneness of the lethal injection and Angel's competency to be executed. At 7.25pm, the appeals were rejected. Present at the execution were Angel's mother, sister and brother. Dr Claudia Benton's husband, George, Josephine Convicker's son, Karen Cernick's brother and Carolyn Frederick's son also attended. Angel, who now said he was Jewish, prayed in Hebrew and Spanish. After much time imagining that the Grim Reaper was around when executions took place at the Florida State Penitentiary, it was now time for Angel to meet the skeletal figure, dressed in black and holding a scythe. Before the lethal injection was administered, Angel said his last words. I want to ask if it is in your heart to forgive me. You don't have to. I know I allowed the devil to rule my life. I just ask you to forgive me and ask the Lord to forgive me for allowing the devil to deceive me. I thank God for having patience in me. I don't deserve to cause you pain. You do not deserve this. I deserve what I am getting. Angel Resendez, also known as the Railroad Killer, was pronounced dead at 8.05pm. He became the 13th inmate executed in Texas that year. After the execution, Dr Claudia Benton's husband, George, spoke words that summed up the havoc and destruction Angel had caused. George said Angel was Evil contained in human form, a creature without a soul, no conscience, no sense of remorse, no regard for the sanctity of human life.